Welcome to Profit and Prosper, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are ready to make some money while doing what they love. On this podcast, we're going to pull back the curtain and talk about all things business and money, but I promise you this is not your typical boring numbers talk. I'm your host, Sarah Young, a CPA and CFO with over a decade of experience in finance, business, and leadership. I'm going to share everything I've learned from helping my clients grow more profitable businesses and keep more of what they earn while growing my own successful business along the way. You'll feel empowered and confident that you too can grow your wealth, live a rich life, and have an impact. Stick with me and you might even start to think that finance is fun. Let's dive in. In this week's episode, I interviewed Caitlin Carlson, who is the founder of Theory Planning Partners. And honestly, y'all, you are going to get to hear from someone who a lot of us don't get to hear from that often. And that is because Caitlin is a wealth advisor for high earning women entrepreneurs and has experience working at one of the biggest wealth advisory banks in the world working specifically with multi-millionaire and even billionaire business owner clients. And the reason I say we don't get to hear from them that often is because I feel like most wealth advisors in this position, they often gatekeep their knowledge and, you know, reserve it for talking to their wealthy clients. But Caitlin is on here talking about all things wealth creation and this interview was so good. So I we spent probably an hour talking to each other before we did the podcast interview. And I think if you like my style, you are going to love Caitlin also because she has a very similar mission to me where we are taking our, you know, in my case, big four experience, in her case, big wealth advisory firm experience and applying that to small business owners to help you build your wealth and leave a legacy, okay? So in this episode, we talked about how you get stuck in the cash flow trap, meaning how business owners don't take care of themselves personally and don't build up their own retirement accounts outside of the business and how they get stuck in the trap of having to stay in their business for longer than they would like. And I have seen this in my experience too. Caitlin has seen it with a lot of people So we talk about how to not be stuck in the cash flow trap. Caitlin talks about the three phases of business that you go through and things that you can invest in at each phase. We talked about what different types of financial planners and financial advisors are out there and how to find a good one, what to look for when you're hiring one. We talked about, you know, what she saw with her wealthy clients, like what were their habits? What were the things that they were doing that you can apply to your business today? This interview was amazing and I cannot wait for you to um, give it a listen and hopefully get some really good insights for your own business, whatever stage you're at. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So let's um, jump in and tell me about your business, Theory Planning Partners, what do you do with clients? Who do you serve? Just tell me all of that good stuff. Sure. Yeah. So um, for a little bit of background, I came from the private wealth management industry. So I worked with multimillionaires, even billionaires in some cases, um, the majority of which were business owners. But when I first got my start in wealth management, I was a wealth planning analyst. And that's when I worked with over 300 clients. Again, the majority of them were business owners. And one thing that I noticed over and over again was um, business owners got caught in what I like to call a cash flow trap, where they were reliant on their business for cash flow to support their lifestyle. And I felt like there was a massive gap in the market, not only because of those 300 clients, all of them were men, but also um, due to the way that the wealth management industry is structured, a lot of them were very poorly prepared for retirement. Um, And so I saw this opportunity to be able to work with women, which was working with female entrepreneurs was a passion of mine, but also being able to work with them in their younger years, in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, to teach them how to build wealth versus expecting them to come to me with wealth. 
So, which is very typical of the wealth management industry, the way that it works, because wealth managers get paid off of liquid assets that they manage is they expect you to come to them with a minimum of say a million dollars. Theory is very different from that. We expect our clients to come to us with zero dollars and we teach them how to translate their business success into personal wealth and a lasting legacy if that's what they choose. Um, So I would say that's, it's been incredibly fulfilling. I've learned a ton about female entrepreneurs. I've worked with I'd say probably three dozen over the last two years. Um, And yeah, it's just been super rewarding. I would say the other massive differentiator for us is that we charge a flat fee, which is very different than the industry. So it really allows us to be not only an advocate for our clients, but also objectively guide them. And in some cases be almost like a protector for them to make sure that they don't get taken advantage of. So yeah, I kind of carved out my own perfect little little niche for myself and I'm I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. So Caitlin and I, we were talking before we recorded this episode, and I think we have so much in common with the way that we love to work with women entrepreneurs. And I think that I agree. I think there's a huge gap when it comes to financial education and knowledge when it comes to women. I think I see a lot of women who don't know as much as men think that they know. (laughs) That's a great way to phrase it. And they, and like, they just don't have the confidence really to, you know, come up with their own investment strategy. And it's something that I talk to clients about. It's like, well, you have this money in your business. We're going to build out your financial strategy, tax strategy, but like taking it to that next level of actually building up your retirement accounts and your other investment accounts so that you're taken care of personally. And so that you don't get in that cash flow trap. And I think that's a really great phrase because, you know, I was telling you before this and podcast listeners have heard me talk about this example, but I have seen time and time again with my CFO clients when they come to me and they're older and they've been living this lifestyle where they've made a ton of money in their business and they've got the nice house and the nice car and the vacation house and all that, but they don't have retirement. And so they're sort of subject to, well, what can you sell your business for? And that's your retirement plan. And you may or may not get enough, right? And so I think we have so many things we can talk about (laughs) just with all this, but let me start sort of at the beginning. When somebody comes to you, you said you're okay if they have zero in assets. Mm -hmm. So for people who are at the, you know, earlier in their business, six figure stage, like growing to seven figures, or maybe people don't even want a seven figure business. What are like the first things that you think people should do when it comes to personal finance and taking care of themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I've learned over the past three years is I, I kind of see it in three stages. So if you are in that stage that you just described, then you're probably in phase one where you're just getting up off the ground. You're just paying your expenses, may be able to afford paying yourself. I would say at every single stage, it always comes back to intention. And we talked about this before, Sarah, you can, one of my favorite quotes is by Yogi Berra. And he says, if you don't know where you're going, you might wind up someplace else. And business owners are the ultimate culprits when it comes to that, because it's so easy to get distracted by your business. And it's a really good excuse to not pay attention to the long term. And so I would say if you're, you're in that phase one where you're getting off the ground, you still need goals to reach for. And thankfully, there are so many resources out there today on the internet. And I would say, you know, Google a retirement calculator and just put in a formula as simple as I want to live off of $100,000 by the time I'm 50 years old and I have $10 in the bank. It'll spit out a number to you of what you need to save in order to hit that goal. So if you're starting your business and you run the simulation on that calculator and it spits out that you need to save, you know, $7,000 a month, make that your first goal. So, you know, when you finally start paying yourself, make sure you factor in the fact that you need to hit that personal goal. And that's really going to give you some semblance of direction. And, And it actually does two things. So it helps you set a goal to reach for But the other thing that it does is it diversifies you away from your business. And the reason why this is really important is because 
for almost every single business owner, what I saw over and over again was 80% of their net worth was wrapped up in their business. And so exactly like you said, Sarah, what happens is they get into their fifties and sixties. And a lot of times it's triggered by a health issue or by fatigue and the value of their business, what they would net from that after taxes is not enough to support their lifestyle. So if you're younger, let's say you're 30 and that goal is $7,000 a month, that's a much smaller goal than $200,000 a month when you're 60 because you didn't plan ahead and you ran out of time. So I would say if you're in that first phase, just do a simple retirement calculation on Google to try to start to get an idea. Once you start moving into phase two is really when you have recurring revenue, you have a sense of where you fit into the market. Um, it's kind of like a client once described it as she felt like she was pushing a boulder up a hill for four years. And now she feels like she's finally at the top of the hill. Stable. Just, yeah. Yes, stable. Exactly. Like there's predictive revenue there. Phase two is really where you're going to decide, am I going to build an enterprise business or am I going to build a lifestyle business? And I would define an enterprise business as I want to build this business to sell it. A lifestyle business is anything else pretty much. And it's really important to, during phase two, start to build out your financial success team. And I would say the people that you want on your financial success team are, of course, a CFO. They're going to provide you with a high-level strategy, a bookkeeper, so you have organized financials, and an accountant that acts as a tax strategist. And this is super important because there's a difference between someone who just files your taxes and someone who's actually helping you make strategic decisions with your taxes that help move you forward from a business standpoint and personally. And then finally, you want a financial planner on that team which would be my company theory. And I would say where we fit into that picture is the first three are mostly focused on your business. We take a holistic approach to your balance sheet. So when I look at your balance sheet as a business owner, which is your assets and your liabilities, your business is one line item on there. And it's probably the largest line item, but there are other aspects of your life that need to be considered and taken into account. So I would say an example of that would be if you're running a $10 million business, most, I actually had this happen the other day. I was talking to someone who's running an $8 million business and she said, oh, my financial, I have a financial advisor. She just treats it as being worth zero. And I was like, that opens you up to so much liability by treating it as zero because her net worth is being significantly understated. And the reason that that matters is because she needs to be protected. Like she should have an umbrella insurance policy to make sure that if someone comes over, if a, her kid's friend comes over and swims in the pool and has an accident that she's not going to get sued and lose her business, you know, based off of not having enough umbrella insurance. So like we take all, we take the entire financial picture into consideration, including like a spouse, including how many kids you have, including estate planning and all of the stuff that comes outside of your business. So I'd say phase two is where you start building out that financial success team. And the other thing that happens in phase two is your bandwidth as a business owner starts going down. So you don't have the time to be quarterbacking among, amongst all these professionals. So we try to step in and project manage that, or at least you should have a financial success team that's fluent with each other, knows how to effectively communicate. And then I would say phase three is kind of like the highest maturity of a business, which is a full-blown enterprise business where you probably do have like a CFO in-house. Um, you are building this company to sell it. We're still there helping you. You still should have a tax strategist, a bookkeeper, all those things. Um, but your goals may be different in the sense that um, it's very clear that you're building a business to sell it. And that's when it's really important to have a great CFO who can lead the strategy. And as I said, build like a best in class business because building a best in class business, as we said earlier, when we were talking, Sarah, like that can mean millions of dollars of difference just by tweaking small things like 
having great key employees, having organized financials, having organized legal documents, that kind of stuff. Yes. So that was a very long-winded answer, but hopefully it. (laughs) No, I wrote, I mean, I wrote down just like a ton of notes, tons of things. I think that, you know, I think phase one, um, and people hear me talk about this all the time. I think it's about knowing your numbers in part. And that's both when I say know your numbers, and I'm usually referring to knowing your revenue, your expenses, your profit, like all of that good stuff. But also knowing like, what is your goal? What is your retirement vision? Like how much do you need to retire so that you can factor that in to your overall budget um, is I think super important. And like, I can tell you because I have worked with at least a hundred clients in my day. Most people don't know those in, like don't know that, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know that. And it's just a super simple first step. So I think if you're listening to this and you're like, I don't even know where to start when it comes to retiring because I'm so busy in my business start with that. Like just literally go Google and maybe I'll find one and link it in the show notes, go Google a retirement calculator and see like, well, what would your retirement number need to be? If I want to retire at 50, like many of us want to retire early, myself included. And what do I need to start putting aside? Because I think sometimes it is eye opening to see, like, it's probably not $50 a month. It's probably Mm. thousands of dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And you might look at it and say, okay, I can't do that right now. And that's when we have to go back to your business and say, well, how can your business cash flow more? Yeah. And this is where having a financial success team, as Caitlin put it, is I think so key because, you know, not that you can't do it without having a financial success team, but I've come into businesses like very late in the game. And it is literally, literally millions of dollars that they're missing out on because they did not do the things early enough in their business to start building their wealth and also build the value of their business. And I would say 90% of business owners that I worked with, especially in private wealth, where they were more in that phase three, still didn't know their numbers. So this isn't like a phase one problem. This is a, (laughs) this is an epidemic among business owners that they just don't know their numbers. Yes. You know, it's, it's truly just, um, a lack of intention. And we're trying to bring intention to the process, you know, through helping you achieve financial success, essentially. Tell me if this sounds like you, your business is growing and you're making more sales than ever, but you still feel all over the place with your money. You're ready for your cash flow to reflect all the hard work you've put into your business. You're ready to make some money and get paid, but you aren't sure how to get there or what to prioritize next to make it happen then let's work on that. My Cashflow Intensive is a one-on-one service that will have you feeling empowered, invigorated, and super clear on your next steps. And we do it all fast. The Intensive is the only way to get my eyes on the behind the scenes of your business without a long-term commitment. In the Intensive, I focus on three areas. I'll review your financials and identify profit leaks preventing you from making more money. I'll show you how to streamline your financial systems to bring in more ease and flow. And I will map out a custom plan that will have you adding 50 to $100,000 to your bottom line in the next 12 months. Together, we'll remove the roadblock so you can make more money in your business fast. Learn more about the cash flow intensive and submit an inquiry to get started at trustyoungco.com forward slash intensive. If you think about like, well, I don't want to, I'm not a numbers person. Like, do you know how many sales calls I get on and women are like, I'm not good at numbers. I'm not a numbers person. I don't love to do this. And I'm like, well, that's fine. You don't have to be, but you need to hire someone who can help you do that. Yes, absolutely. And I think one thing I get asked a lot is like, who do I go to for what? And so I think this is a great time to clarify. So in terms of giving you that number that the retirement calculator would give you, that's a very simplistic way of going about it, but you need to start somewhere. So a financial planner is going to give you that high level number. And then a CFO is going to help you hit that number. But it's very important to have a number that we need to hit. And a CFO is going to help you say, okay, well, if this is the goal, then we can't afford to hire this person just yet. And I think people get caught in like, oh, the sexiness of hiring a virtual assistant or an executive assistant. And it's like, well, 
if you can actually hit your personal goals by answering emails yourself for a little bit longer, then <laughs> that's probably worth the money to just continue answering your own emails and using your own Calendly, you know, but like, especially in the online world, there's kind of this like fascination with the superficial of, oh, like have my EA do it. Or like, I still answer my own emails because that's just how I feel personally. I'm like, would I rather fund my retirement or have someone else answer my emails? I'm like, you know what? I actually prefer to answer my own emails. So that's a personal decision, but you need someone to put that in con context for you. Cause otherwise you're just throwing money around. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm in support of like hiring the right people. And you know, mm -hmm. what I like to talk about is like, what, knowing the goal, what is the thing that's going to make you more profitable? And like, is this hire really like the roadblock? Is this really stopping you from making more money? Because there's a point where it's like a nice to have mm. versus like a need to grow your business to the next level. So there's always a balance, which is where having a CFO comes into play because we can talk about those things. And sometimes so, people come to me with those questions and that's where, so I require my clients to have a CFO because that is more a question for you, Sarah, than it is for me. When does somebody need to hire a financial planner and how do you find a good one? Because I see a lot of business owners who work with people and it honestly gets me really worked up because it's like they're working with people who are basically selling them life insurance and they're not really planning they're not really helping them think holistically about their personal financial picture so how do you find a good financial planner somebody who actually helps you do that and then when is the best time to hire that person the financial industry is very confusing to the consumer. And I think one of the things that Sarah and I both come across quite often is when people think that insurance salespeople are the same thing as financial advisors, and they're not. So a lot of it comes down to, first of all, their credentials. So one of the things that you want to make sure of is that you're working with a CFP, a certified financial planner because they will have the education and all of the important aspects of holistically guiding you. However, I would say that's not enough because there are insurance people that have CFPs. It's also important to understand where they're working and why they're working there. So if they're working at an insurance company, that means that the first goal for them is to sell the products of the insurance company. So I would say, look for an RIA, which is a registered investment advisor. That's what my company Theory Planning Partners is. I own Theory outright. I make all the decisions on who we, who we custody through, which means like where we hold your assets, um, my expenses in terms of financial planning software, my expenses in terms of financial research. I'm not beholden to anybody like I was when I worked at UBS financial services. So I can give you a, a brief overview. So there are basically like three different um, avenues within the financial planning or wealth management. I think yes, because when I talk to clients, I'm like, we need to start, we need to invest in things. We need to start, you know, thinking about retirement. And I'm like, you can totally, and my accounts, I'll tell you, are just at Fidelity because I can have all of my stuff there and I'm educated enough about finance and my husband is to manage it ourselves mm -hmm. right? for now. And when people think, well, I, it makes me nervous to do that on my own. Like I want to go find someone. I think it is really confusing and it's so easy to end up with somebody who is a glorified insurance salesperson. And there's a time and place for having life insurance, but there's a red flag to me when I get a new client come in and they've got like a hundred grand in a retirement account and then life insurance policies. Yes. Like the yeah. time and place for life insurance policies isn't when you're like, generally speaking, just when you're like beginning, like it's not the first investment I would make, but Correct. I'll let Caitlin speak to that. No, you're absolutely right. So, um, because there are so much more inexpensive solutions to help you build, build wealth in a very cost-effective way. There are these things called the wirehouses, which is where I started my career. So that's going to be like UBS, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, Wells Fargo. 
these are massive banks that have multiple branches to them at UBS. I mean, in all of these cases, it's like make money for the firm first for yourself second and the client third. And I hated that. Like I just, it did not align with me philosophically. And so, which is part of the reason why I ended up leaving. So you have the big banks and they kind of sell you on this like sexy dream of we have big downtown offices and like, look how great and fancy we are. And we sponsor, you know, F1 races and stuff. Then you have the independents, which are like Raymond James. I don't know if Edward Jones would fall in this category, but like LPL. And, and part of that behind the scenes goes to like how advisors get paid. UBS takes a percentage of the revenue that you bring in. Same thing with independents. The independents take a, re- a revenue portion of what the advisor brings in. They just take less. So a lot of times you would see people move from like a wire house into an independent. And then there's this final sleeve, which is the RIAs, the registered independent advisors. And so that's what I am, where no one takes a portion of my revenue. I'm responsible for all my revenue and all my expenses and all my compliance and that stuff. But I can run my company however I want to. And for me, it's making sure that I represent the client to the best of my ability and I minimize expenses. So one red flag to you should be if you're being sold a product, even if that means like not just an insurance product, but at UBS, like one really popular thing was selling these like complex structured products, which are really expensive. Or the other thing is like, we could only sell UBS mortgages. And they used to have these things called like banking champions. Now, by far the worst culprit of this is Wells Fargo, because I feel like they're always in the news (laughs) for some type of scandal. But the thing is, like I said, their main goal is make money for the firm, make money for yourself, make money for the client. And that's always how it's going to be when you're working with a firm. So when you're interviewing people, I would say, is this a registered investment advisor? That's really going to be like the best indication that they're most aligned with you as a client. Now, it's not an end-all be-all solution. I will say the other thing that makes theory extremely unique is we charge a flat fee. We do not charge an assets under management fee. And I can give you a short lesson here. So assets under management is typically how advisors get paid. So if Sarah gives me a million dollars, I charge her 1%, which means that I make $10,000 off of managing her million dollars. The reason why advisors love this model is because the market typically goes up and it has been for the last 15 years. So for delivering the same services every year, Sarah's account has grown from 1 million to 1.7 million. So every year my compensation is going from 10,000 to essentially 17,000 if she has 1.7 million. And advisors love this for a couple of reasons. One, the market tends to always go up. Two, it comes directly out of the client account. So the client's not getting an invoice. They don't see it come out. It's very much like a silent fee that's taken out essentially. And you'll see this like even on, (laughs) actually we were watching the US Open this weekend and there was actually a Fidelity commercial where it's like, you know, are we do well if you do well? Sure, yeah, that's true but you're also motivated by how much I keep in public stocks and bonds. And so that's another reason why we charge a flat fee because I want to be completely objective in guiding my clients, whether they want to invest in the public markets or they want to invest in real estate or they want to invest in another business. And that's a huge departure from my industry. And the reason why it's not that common is because advisors don't think it's as lucrative as the AUM model. So that's another thing to look out for. So yeah, I think all of that is like super educational and I totally agree. I think that going to the sort of traditional like finance bro model of like, they're the ones who hold the knowledge. They're the ones who like, they're the gatekeepers of your like portfolio And, you know, I think it, it goes back to like women, a lot of women just don't have confidence in Mm. taking care of themselves financially. And they make it seem they being the like 
I'll call them finance bros because that's like the best way I can think to describe it is they make it seem like it has to be complicated. Yes. Yeah. Like you have to do, well, let's do these super fancy products. And like, this is the way you're going to, this is the secret. This is what nobody's telling you. This is what the rich people do to get richer. And I'm like, I just hate shit like that because it's not. It's not true. There was a study that came out of Fidelity that the best performing accounts were the ones that people forgot about. Yes. The ones that you just put your money in and forget it, right? Yes. Or no, I think I read one and it said the best performing accounts were the ones where the people had died Mm -hmm. and like they couldn't actually, they were not physically there to make the changes. Yes. It's so true. Investing is not, investing should be incredibly boring. Like, yes. and it's not very complicated, yes. which is another reason why I didn't really feel like I should be getting paid off of asset center management. Like, yes, I think it's important to set up a good asset allocation, but once you've done that, it's really the, the thing that I think I get paid for more than anything is managing behavior. So yeah. when we're in a time like right now, I, I really, because from the start, I train my clients pretty well. So I don't really get calls during downturns like this. But everyone's always like, oh, you must be so busy right now getting so many calls. And, and the thing is like people get scared and they want to change course and it's, you need to stay the course because it, actually this was shared with me early in my career that watching the markets is like watching someone walk up a mountain with a yo-yo and you can pay attention to the yo-yo or you can pay attention to the person walking up the mountain. And so something like CNBC or the Wall Street Journal, like these are companies that have to produce news and they get paid to be sensational. So they get paid based off of focusing on the yo-yo because it would be really boring to focus on the person that's walking up the mountain. And and so they really sensationalize everything and it makes people Mm -hmm. panic when really like the best thing that you could do is just stay the course, which comes back to why it's so important to have a financial plan. And so I wish I could give you a perfect answer on when to hire a financial planner, I would say as soon as possible. Um, and thankfully now that the industry is changing, it does come in many forms. So you could pay for like a one-time financial plan to just give you some semblance of direction. And there are people that offer that. I would say a great resource for that is something called XY planning network. Those are mostly millennial financial advisors. A lot of them do offer like subscription fees and they do tend to work with people who have may just be starting their asset accumulation journey. So that's- I I do. I love that you said that because I think that for most people, like until you have a million dollars in your investment balance, you really like, you need the help, like having a direction, but when it comes to management, like you're not going, like investing doesn't mean you're sitting there trading stocks every day. Right. Even if you have someone managing it for you, they're not trading stocks every day. Like you're literally going to pick a few like funds to put your money in and like, you're going to put it there and you're going to set up an auto draft and they'll help you figure out how much should I put in? What funds should I put it in? And then you just set it up and you kind of forget it. Yes, absolutely. And then you don't have to have the ongoing fees, right? Of like, Mm -hmm. right? The asset management fee and all that mess. Yeah. And really like where the money is made is in the planning. It's in like the tax strategy and in the strategic decisions that you're making day to day. And also like the discipline. I mean, I would say the wealthiest people that I know were just disciplined. And, and did the right things and also lived below their means. I mean, it's really as simple as that. It's spend less than you make. <laughs> <laughs> spend less than you make and make sure that you are actually investing some of it and not just piling up cash in a savings account. <laughs> yes, you will, especially in today's environment. So I, I would say that's another thing is there's a risk to every asset class. So like you said, Sarah, a lot of women that we start out with are not confident in their financial literacy and they feel safe with cash. And the thing that I would point out is that when we're in climates like this, where we've been seeing 8% inflation since January, your cash is getting eaten alive. So your purchasing power is going down every single month by sitting in cash. So it might make you feel good to have it sitting there and not changing in value versus being in the market and losing money. But over a long period of time, that cash is not going to grow to keep up with inflation. And so to every single asset class, and by that, I mean cash, stocks, bonds, real estate, 
there are pros to each and there are cons to each. And that's a big part, part of what we do too, is we educate women to, to know that and understand that because if something is going up, no matter what, like every single day, every single month, then it's probably run by Bernie Madoff and you're probably not going to get your money back. <laughs> okay. Here's kind of my like last sort of big question that I want to talk about. And I want to maybe use a real life example. We can use me as an example. When you look at a business owner, so like, for example, I'm running a business. I will do mid six figures this year. Based on my planning, I expect to hit seven, maybe like 2023, right? So you work with like seven plus figure entrepreneurs. So if you're looking at me and you say, I want to potentially sell my business one day. My husband and I love real estate. We um, also want to be able to retire early. So I'm 35 and I want to be able to retire by the time I'm 45. Like, what would you say I need to do like in the, in the interim between having enough coming in the door to make it worthwhile to work with somebody like you? I would say that's where it's also not particularly a hard and fast rule because we can take someone on who has a multi six figure business, but has great profit margins. So just because you're running a seven figure business doesn't mean that you're overflowing in cash. Oh, I know. I know that (laughs) sometimes we find quite the opposite. Um, so I would say we take it on a case by case basis. Um, so on that note, feel free to reach out at any point, but the first thing that we do is we figure out where you are right now. So you kind of just outlined that, you know, you're 35, you're running a multi six figure business. The next thing we do is we set a goal, which you also stated. So you want to retire by 45. I find business owners are like pretty concretely split between this where they're just like you, where they're like, I know I want to be financially independent by 45, or there's another batch where they say, I want to work for the rest of my life. And so we need to rein those people in and kind of give them a reality check that they may not always feel that way. And also like giving yourself the luxury of building towards financial independence, you know, so if you don't feel that way, when you're 45, you can stop. And then it's really just, I mean, a financial plan is as simple as where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? And so that's really where, you know, financial planning is part art, part science. So it's not always just as simple as like crunching the numbers. It's, it's factoring in, I mean, we're human beings. And I would say between your personal life, your business and the tax landscape, those the three things are constantly changing. And so that's where having a financial planner, financial advisor, holding your hand alongside you to help guide you year to year it is really important. And that's where like you get the reward of a long-term relationship. Start being proactive about this sooner rather than later. And, and like I said, there are different ways to engage planners. So there are some planners that just do standalone financial plans. And then there are some planners that will take you on if they think that you're a good fit. So if you you came to me with a highly profitable multi six figure business, and you've stated all these clear goals, like we could probably start working together now, you know? And so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but to give you, give you color, I think because it's part art and part science, we do take it on a a case by case basis. Um, I think what I'm hearing mm -hmm. is have a goal Mm -hmm. and start to get clear on what that looks like. I'm clear on what that looks like because it's what I preach to clients all day, every day. (laughs) (laughs) And then I think my next thing is just like, don't, for me, I would tell my clients, don't wait until you get to the seven figure business. Like if I were yes, coaching yeah. myself on it, I would say, <clears throat> Sarah, don't wait until 2023. When you think you're going to have a seven figure business, like start putting money aside. You can talk to your tax person too, and say like, well, what are the things that give me some tax advantages? What can I start investing in now just to even build the habit I find a lot of our like financial success comes down to our money habits, like our day-to-day, what are we doing? Right. And you're not just magically when I get to seven figures, like I'm not just poof, like going to put tons of money in the bank if I don't have the habit of doing that. 
So I think start with the goal is what I'm hearing. And then um, if you want help with a plan, I think you gave a resource. Was it XY planning? Mm -hmm. XY planning network. Yes. I think maybe start with a financial plan and like dip a toe in there and then start building your way up, I think is amazing. Okay. This is my last like official interview question is so, cause you've worked with multimillionaires, billionaires. What is the secret to getting to be like very wealthy? Oh, the secret. Um, I asked this question sort of tongue in cheek because I know there, there's not a secret, no but secret. I like to see yeah. what people say. Like, what is, are they doing anything differently? Like, what are they doing that a business owner early in their journey is not doing? So some things that I saw, first generation wealth was my favorite to work with. So first generation wealth, meaning like they were the ones that made the money. So they obviously have a high risk tolerance, but they're also extremely disciplined and they have a really strong temporal perspective. And by that, I mean, they think in decades, they don't think in days. And I think that's, something really important that I saw early on was like, they were making decisions for years down the road, not days this week. They just got into routines. They did the right things and they had patience. You know, I think another thing that we tend to see is like these stories that get sensationalized about like, I grew my business to seven figures in my first year. That's amazing, but it's probably not a sustainable business or you probably have things falling apart that you need to fix. Building a multi seven or eight figure business is it takes years and to do it right, it it is an organic process. Now I will say people who, again, first generation wealth, like they were intellectually curious. And so they wouldn't make disempowering statements like I'm not good with money or I don't understand numbers, or I don't like numbers. Like they care oh, about I hear that all the time, all the time. <laughs> That's a disempowering statement. And you're writing yourself off the further away you are from the money, the harder it is to keep it. I'd say not even make it because some people are just naturally talented at making money, but you're not going to keep it and manage it and protect it. If you don't have some semblance of an idea of what's going on. So they were intellectually curious enough to start becoming financially literate. Um, and then when they got to a certain level, they were successful enough to surround themselves with the right team, um, and start to delegate. But, um, I, yeah, I'd say the secret is there is no secret. There is no secret, (laughs) but I think all of those things that you just said are incredibly actionable for any person listening to this, who Mm -hmm. feels like, well, I don't have a ton of money, so I'm just going to, you know, wait until I have more cash flow coming in. I think you can work on these behaviors and habits and mindsets that you have to prep yourself to even have money to begin with. Because I think without those things, you will not have money. Setting up the habits is the most important part. It's not really the amount it's start with like a dollar or, Ah. you know, even I tell people, I'm like, can you even just set up an automatic transfer of $50 into Mm -hmm. Go and open, like, you know, if I tell my client, like you can put, you know, your $6,000 IRA contribution, like that's your max. I know you may not have $6,000 right now, but can we take $50 Mm -hmm. and put it in every month? Like that is a better than zero for multiple reasons. One, because yes, it will grow and it may not be millions, but it will grow. And two, you're developing the habit of investing. Yes, absolutely. And just like anything, you know, I didn't come into the financial industry, like, an expert. It took me 10 years to get familiar with the jargon and and comfortable with how the markets work. And it's just familiarity. So yeah, I agree with you, Sarah. I think that it's, you know, start, there's no reason not to start today because you can start somewhere, which is better than starting nowhere. Yes. All right. So here's my last question. I ask this of everybody who comes on and you are also an entrepreneur. We've been talking about your expertise, but you're also a business owner. And so I like to ask people the less fun things of like saving and investing and cash flow and all of that. But what is something that your business will enable you to upgrade in your life that you have not yet done? So like my example is 
one day I want to upgrade my life and have a lake house and a boat. That is my Mm. ideal life upgrade. What is yours? I love that. You know, what's really funny is, so we live in a little seaside town that has, it's really cool because it's like our house is over 300 years old. It was from before the revolutionary war, but it's got a nice mix of old houses and then like really, really beautiful homes. And so sometimes I drive around the town and I just look at the different houses and where I might want to live someday. And it's really cool because I'll go home and look on Zillow and I'll look at like what the estimated mortgage is. And I'm like, oh, I can do that easily. Like that's only three more clients, you know, and that is not a mentality that I had as an employee. So I think the unlimited potential is the coolest thing about being an entrepreneur that and being able to pick my son up from daycare and not have to answer anybody. No, absolutely. Like we just talked about this. I'll tell this story quickly. Like I had a dream a few days ago that I was back at my old job at Deloitte. So I worked at Deloitte for four years doing audits and I leave my office between three and four every day to go pick my son up from daycare because it's important to me to have that time with him at the end of the day. And in my dream, they wanted me to stay until like eight o'clock every day because it was like legitimately frowned upon to leave. And I was so mad in my dream. And I woke up and I was like, thank God I am where I am now, because I could not have this life back in my old job. So, you know, I think that's an amazing upgrade that doesn't really require money either. So, yeah. And the other thing that's real, like, I didn't love all the people that I worked with when I was at UBS in terms of clients and having the freedom to say, you know, I think you're a great fit, or I don't think you're a great fit and only allow people into my life that I absolutely love supporting is also a massive luxury that can't be overstated. No, absolutely. Like I, I love my clients. Like I love to talk to them and, and my team too. Like I've picked my team. So they're also amazing and it makes my life every day, 10 times better. So I think that's a great upgrade. I just think it's fun to talk about like, how will you have fun with your money instead of always, you know, focusing on like, Oh, I should, make sure I invest more. Like you should absolutely do that, but also take advantage of the fact that you have the freedom in your Mm -hmm. business to do whatever you want. And you can also have fun. So I think that's exciting. Well, this was amazing. And, Mm -hmm. um, I'm just really glad I met you because I feel like we have so many things in common. So that's also fun. And tell us before we go, where can people find you? How can people work with you? So my website is theoryplanning.com and there's a link on there to book a call with me. It's just a really simple one page website. Um, You can find me on LinkedIn at Caitlin Carlson. And I also am on Instagram at Instagram at theory planning partners. However, my Instagram is not nearly as cool as Sarah's yet. I just, I have a love hate relationship with social media. So just getting back on there. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, very accessible through my website or happy to answer a, <clears throat> answer a message on LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and all of the secrets, quote unquote. Um, <laughs> I think this was amazing and I'm so grateful you were here. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I love this. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Now, I want you to go take some action. What's one thing you can do this week to create more profit in your business? Send me a DM on Instagram at youngcocfo and share your action item with me. If you have a question or topic you'd like me to dive into, or if you're feeling empowered about taking charge of your finances, let's continue the conversation. Go to profitandprosper.co to submit a question or topic for me to talk about on the show. And because we all profit and prosper better with friends, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe wherever you listen, and share the episode. Make sure you tag me at youngcocfo on Instagram so I can give you some love, and I'll see you in the next episode.